connect with sisters and and to to share the resources because when you go through a cancer diagnosis and journey you don't know where to find resources or who can help you or or what kind of programs are there and Gail is right there are programs that are available um, and one that she had referenced was through the cancer support center where not only that that wasn't that is an organization where you would normally go to one of the two locations and there are other support centers around but i bring that up to tell you that as you the more you know the more you can share and the more you can share you can help everyone grow and grow to get through this destination and this journey of life but they have provided services through the pandemic which are virtual zoom and online the tasha c joiner foundation is continuing to do exactly what we did when before Pan, before the pandemic and pre-COVID days, where through our network of sisters, as Gail says, you show up, you, you provide whatever encouragement or light that needs to be given to a butterfly in that, in that stage, whether it's flowers, whether it's a note, a card, whether it's a, a, a stuffed animal or food or, or, um, uh, the hard to find sanitizer, when, when that was so hard to find, there was no worry. The butterflies were knocking at your door and they were giving those supplies. They give so much. And to, oh, I'm sorry. I know I could talk <laughs> on and on. <laughs> That's okay. We, we appreciate the information, but what I want to share with you, and I think we have one more butterfly before we go to our last speaker, is you are not insignificant, my sister. You Thank are appreciated. You. you ladies that I help to navigate through the healthcare systems do not look like what you've been through. And I am blessed to be able to assist and thank you for all your kind words. We appreciate and, it. And thank the Tasha J. Uh, J. Jordan Foundation for teaching us and giving us back life and a zeal for life and, and able to share with others. Thank you, sweetie. I think Elizabeth, Alicia, are you on the line and able to speak for a few minutes? Yes, I'm on the line. All right. Can you give us a few minutes of, um, of your journey and what the butterflies be before we end up with Candace? Sure. First Thank of you. all, uh, my name is Elizabeth Rivera. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2012. Um, it's been a while, so thank God I, I don't really remember the date, which is weird. I do remember October 13th, but not the year. Anyway, um, a butterfly is someone that evolves. And so in um, being a butterfly, I've evolved in so many ways. So when this Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We hear you. Okay, we hear you. Yes. Uh, something happened with my uh, computer. So I have to start your video. I'll start my video. Okay. Um, so when Kovac was, um, breaking news, I went into anxiety mode and not just for myself, but for others that I knew that was in the same position as I was, our immune system is low. Um, how do we handle this? Um, do I have enough supplies? Sadly, um, we were scrounging around for supplies. Uh, we are, um, oh, I went into the emergency mode. I'm a mom, I'm a cancer survivor. So I went into emergency uh, mode. I started uh, compiling an idea to make sure that all the butterflies had enough supplies, either we had masks, we had uh, hand sanitizers, and believe me, I had to buy, find gallons and pour them into different containers because there was no resources. So anxiety was very high. While Kovac is still out there, um, I feel a little bit better. I have lots of, uh, steps in place for myself. I am an essential worker. So I take care of children. So I I'm at high risk 
when children come into my home and they leave and go into their homes and then return. So uh, I am very careful with everything that I do. And so with all this experience trying to deal with COVAC now, which I don't have a lot, but what I have, I like to share with my butterflies. So um, just to say that I'm still in anxiety mode, but not as much. I know that this will all somehow work itself out, but we must work together and we must not be afraid to see our doctors, like flu season is coming around. We must encourage our um, sisters and brothers that are dealing with cancer to get our flu shots and continue to live our lives. So I thank you everyone for letting me to participate in this conference. I've learned a few pointers just listening to the others and I'm very privileged to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Butterflies. We appreciate the knowledge, the love, and see you soon. So last but not least, another powerful survivor. I'm going to ask that Candace, she's a Chief Survivor and Officer of the Blue Head Foundation, share your story um, regarding your journey and COVID. Hi, thank you, thank you. Some powerful testimonies from the, the Butterflies, but I'd expect nothing Less, I was sitting you know, back, you know, back here going, "Amen." And uh, <laughs> um, so, for me, I'm a colorectal cancer survivor, and I was diagnosed at 35. And so, that journey for me, 17 years ago, has been one of not so much the the, fin the uh, physical side, but the financial side, which is something that a lot of people don't talk about, or they weren't talking about it then, you know, about the financial toxicity of cancer. And I, underst and I understood that, you know, because a lot of people, A, you know, you know don't want to talk about because of embarrassment, uh, and B and C, you know, because it's nobody's business. But it leads me to why I started the Blue Hat Foundation, because when I was diagnosed at 35, a mom with five children and great insurance, everything, but couldn't have, there were no resources available at the time to assist me at all because colon cancer in 2003 really wasn't on the list of cancers that were um, supported by, you know, certain organizations. And so, and when, and every time we turned for resources, there weren't any resources available or I wasn't sick enough <laughs> as if the word cancer itself doesn't make you sick. And so, you know, and, and I can, I, I, and I'm speaking the way I'm talking about it now, now is hindsight, you know, because during the time that I was going through it, I, I didn't understand any of this. And when you're in the midst of a fight, you know, for your life, and then you have to find resources and you're fighting to stay in your house, just you're, you're fighting to keep everything you worked hard to, you know, to earn. That's a whole nother level of an emotional trauma, you know, mental trauma, you know, and that led me to, you know, committing, you know, attempting to commit suicide because at that point I had nothing left. I was homeless with five children and the only financial uh, avenue that I had was insurance that I knew would take care of my children with them and someone else, but I wasn't successful with that, which has led me to making sure that no one else in my position feels as if they have no other avenues for life. And so the Blue Hat Foundation was formed as a result of my cancer journey, not having resources, not having you know, any type of financial connections or you know, resources that could help me with um, helping me fill out uh, applications for social security, helping me information. I didn't even know that when I filed for social security, I could have uh, um, appealed it, but you know, I didn't have that information. I didn't, and I didn't have the, the, the mindset. Um, my mom was diagnosed with COVID-19 earlier this year. And that was such a stressful time because prior to that, she also was diagnosed with um, Bell's palsy. So we didn't know how COVID was going to affect her. Um, and 
she actually had a very mild case. She was able to, she survived it, thank God. Um, but although she was still, you know, still very sick, she wasn't as sick as a lot of people that we've, you know, we've seen on the news and we've heard about. She didn't have to be hospitalized. She had to be quarantined at home. And so that meant that we have, we had to actually figure out ways to assist her, you know, from, you know, going to the grocery store to doing laundry, to preparing food, to making sure that she had doctor's appointments and medications and things like that. So we had to become creative in ways of how we entered the house and how we exited the house, how we made sure she had things. And so those are challenges that you face with loved ones, you know, with COVID and being a cancer survivor myself, I also had to protect myself. And so, you know, but that was my mom. And so whatever that needed to be done, we were going to do. Um, so these are, these are the challenges that we're facing and then patients and dealing with patients that um, are in active treatment, but want, you know, but fearfully not wanting to continue treatment because they had to go into the hospital. And so, you know, at the foundation, we were encouraging patients to continue their treatment and that the hospital was actually one of the most safest places for you because of the fact that they weren't letting any, you know, outside people in other than the other than patients and encouraging them to continue their treatment because we know that active treatment, patients in active treatment, they need that treatment. And, and especially with colon cancer, colorectal cancer, and some, you know, some of that are, that are in uh, stage four, which is very aggressive, you know, with some, with some colon cancers, especially young people, making sure that they continue their treatment and understanding that even though we are in the middle of a pandemic, you still need to protect yourself. You still need to continue treatment and to, you know, and to encourage them to have the conversations with their physicians when they felt uncomfortable, not to just, you know, discontinue treatment, but to find out if there were options. And so we were able to find options where there were nurses that were able to come to the homes of the patients, you know, of course, in hazardous, you know, at hazardous uh, uniforms. But, you know, we, we actively help patients continue their treatment and encourage them to continue uh, into, um, uh, during, you know, continue treatment during the pandemic. Uh, myself recently just got out of the hospital um, for, um, you know, colon cancer related uh, issues and um, and wind up having three different uh, bacterias that, you know, we knew, but it wasn't from the hospital, it was from the fact that it was a gut bacteria and, and the operation I had was on my abdomen. And so, um, and that was a time where I was like, okay, I have to have this surgery. It's a life-saving surgery. And I knew the risk going in, but I also knew that quality of life was important. And so I made the decision that even though during a pandemic, I still needed to live and I still needed to have a quality of life. And although I had the, um, the uh, three different bacteria strains that I, was, that, was, that I was fighting, I still felt that the hospital itself did everything they could and everything to make sure that I survived and everything to keep me comfortable and to make sure that whatever it was that I was fighting, they were on top of it. And so I never felt as if anything that was going on in the hospital was something that I feared for COVID. And so then, which is one of the things that I encourage patients is like, fear will kill you because it will keep you from doing the things you need to do to save your life. And I say that because I just recently lost my brother from fear of not maintaining his health and going to the doctors on time. And so he's my younger brother. So this is very personal. And so I wanna encourage anyone if you're fearing going to the doctor, don't do that. You have loved ones that love you. You have children, you have grandchildren and they need you here. Fear is a killer. Fear of the unknown. None of us know when we are going to die. So to fear screenings, to fear life-saving medical procedures, don't do that. Don't do that. And so that's just my message. And so thank you for having me on the panel and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you so much. On behalf of Czech, I would like to thank all of our panelists because we are you and you are we. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our panelists and all your vulnerability with your stories and all the work, amazing work that you do and continue to do. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to set up a reminder. I will. 
I wanted to say thank you to, to, to uh, I wanted to repeat thank you for your vulnerability to all our speakers and for all the continued wonderful work you, you do. Um, just a reminder that we are having our raffle and um, there should be a link in the Zoom chat. I know that we were, we were taken down off of Facebook Live, but we did set up a YouTube Live. So the links for, for those will be posted in the chat here and uh, on Zoom as well as the chat on, on YouTube. So you can sign up for the, for the raffle. But yeah, thank you so much, um, Paz. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, but we'll be moving on to our second session, which is on the Chicago Czech Partnership and the lessons learned. So through the dedication and work of Chicago Czech's Community Steering Committee and community partners, Chicago Czech has made many achievements since 2015 and has gained many valuable learning lessons. Here to share some of these highlights with you are Chicago Czech Community Engagement Corps co-leaders, Ida Giacello, who is an educator and a writer and uses research for community mobilization to address health equity and social justice issues, as well as Dr. Janine Tahira Geza. So, um, you guys could go ahead and get ready. Go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for being with us. Good morning or, or good afternoon, I guess. Um, first of all, I really wanted to commend all the speakers and all the uh, remarks and testimony given this morning. They have been extremely, they're amazing and they have been extremely inspirational, at least for me, because I also have been going through cancer journey with my father who died of liver cancer, my brother who died of, of pancreatic cancer, my aunt who died of breast cancer, my husband that died of lung cancer, and my daughter, husband currently is under radiation for prostate cancer. So I also know at the personal level, the kinds of struggles and challenges and your words were extremely valuable and it touched me very deeply as I remember those experiences. Uh, I wanted to say that I'm gonna be, and I don't see all the screen uh, verbally, but I, um, I wanna say that, um, that I'm responsible, I was asked uh, to speak about the partnership and give a very brief background of the kinds of, uh, of, of what our partnership is all about. And I have the honor to also share uh, the slides with Janice. So uh, let me get started. Thank you. The next one, please. The, to begin with, I wanted, um, I guess it, it went out of order. Uh, we're, so I'm supposed to be talking about uh, the purpose of the presentation. So let me begin by saying that the purpose of the presentation is to provide a very br brief background of the Chicago Cancer Health Collaborative and to share some selected achievement challenges and lessons learned and to encourage you to join us in addressing cancer health equity. There's a lot of work ahead of us. And so um, verbally, I'm in the wrong, you have the wrong set of slides in the, in the screen. Thank you. And while we get the right set of slides, let me say that as, as a Puerto Rican, I, you know, I have the tendency to speak fast when I have a lot to say. Sometimes I go too fast. Sometimes I mix my English with Spanish or sometimes I speak a different language that is not English or Spanish. So bear with me uh, as I do this presentation. The next one, thank you. So why is it that we are focusing on cancer related issues? The testimony really give the context about we, why we are so committed in really developing the partnership between community and academic entity but also in really addressing the diverse need that cancer survivor or people at risk or those that are living currently with cancer are experiencing. When you look at this particular slide, you find that 68% of the city of Chicago population consists of racial and ethnic minority. The first slide, at least to my left, you have the cancer mortality for the entire city of Chicago and different uh, sections tell us where the darker session tell us where the mortality is the highest. When you compare with the next map, which is about the African-American and, and the following one, which is about the Latino community resident, 
you clearly see how there is a strong association between cancer incidence and mortality, and, uh, and particularly a problem in minority community. The last one, this map that you see there also highlight the poverty level. So it's not only the racial and ethnic minority, but those that are poor, those are racial and ethnic minority that experience high incidence and higher mortality. And so that's one of the reasons why we focus in on this. The next slide. The other reason is that building partnership is very, very critical. Because in partnerships since the 1980, we have found out that it's a best practice. We've been developing community network partnerships in the area of HIV AIDS, in the area of type two diabetes and asthma and the list goes on and on. And what they have in common is the fact that you have multi-sectorial people representing different sectors from the community, from the professional sector, working together trying to figure out how can we best bring our knowledge, our experience, and everything else, our own personal experience, knowledge in many different ways, particularly community knowledge and cultural knowledge of those community to be able to address the kinds of issues that are happening in our community. So Chicago Check is community driven. Everything that we do, it really involves continuous daily consultation, including preparation of this PowerPoint. It was the community, <laughs> the co-chairs working very long hours together with the staff and the investigator, trying to make sure that in this presentation, we convey the reality about the community involvement and how they really care and want to make sure that in every single detail that we do collectively represent our effort. The next one, please. So in addition to the community, we have the academic institution. So this is a very unique project because for the first time we have three universities coming together, North, Northwestern University, University of, of uh, Eastern uh, Illinois University and the University of Illinois Chicago and their cancer, uh, comprehensive cancer centers that, that at least two of them have. And so they, this is a very powerful group of people that are sharing resources with the community, sharing knowledge, and really making sure that we, in terms of the Chicago Czech Community Engagement Collaborative, are not only expanding for maintaining our partnership throughout the years and engaging in meaningful education and outreach activities, and that we are, the community are providing the kinds of input in other areas of the Chicago Czech that has to do with research, as the research component of this project that we're not gonna be talking about right now. They also need you know, a series of assistance in recruiting racial and ethnic minority and people living with cancer or survivor or at high risk. And they also, we also need community input in the form of training our new generation of health professional or cancer center. The next one. So here, in terms of this background, what you see is a tremendous amount of activities in the area of community education, outreach. In the, uh, and, and in the beginning, we started by engaging in action planning, as we call it, getting people to get excited, to be able to conceptualize what exactly they want to make the impact long term and short term, and to make sure that we are collectively leveling the field where the community and the investigators and the fellows and many others are in the same level. Uh, the community bring a lot of the community knowledge and culture and they bring expertise. They may not say the same kind of jargon that we may use in research, but their input are so meaningful. They're so bright, their ideas so much targeted into the kinds of work that needs to take place. So there's been tremendous amount of work that we have been conducting, and this is our fifth year in the fifth community forum of this nature. And that's why we have so many collection of photos and activities that we have been able to uh, comply to all the year. The next one. Here uh, is some selected achievement. Uh, on one hand, you have some charts that provide evidence about how we have been increasing our outreach and educational activity 
either because we have planned or participated or supported over 150 community evidence. We have reached over 14,000 individuals and family. We have promoted cancer prevention and care at local community events. And here's a listing of the many kinds of events that we have been actively involved from Vive Su Vida, Get Moving, that Esther Chamarera every year from the Chicago Hispanic Health Coalition put in place, Fiesta de Sol in Pilsen, that Esther was able to help us uh, from Alivio and many others, the Hope Fest in Humboldt Park, the, Fie the First Lady Health Walk and Run 5K in Burham Park, Beyond October, uh, hope in action in the near south side. And then we also work in collaboration with elected officials like Congressman Danny Davis in his World Health Day picnic and parade. So this gives you a sense of the amount of activities that are taking place, the amount of people that are involved directly or indirectly with all our events and the diversity of community that we are reaching out because we wanted to be as fair as possible to make sure that our message, our word of prevention and care goes into the diverse community in question. Next one. And here are more photos. And I really want to thank again the staff, you know, Beverly, Edgardo, Maggie, um, uh, Melissa Martinez and many others they were able and, and Alicia they were able to identify a number of photos from our archive they really uh, support what we're saying the particular flyer that you have there is about screen able because we have been successful or reaching out to the disability community and in that particular event that took place it was a celebration of the wellness for women with disability. So we don't forget about our women. They are having a particular physically or mental challenges. Next. And so it, the, this is all the photo that relate as well as other with the annual community forum. So we have planned and implemented, like I said before, four annual community forums. They have been attended by over 200 people in average. Uh, we face to face now is different because of the pandemic. We have developed a community resource guide because one of the many things that have taken place in our forum is that people tell us what are their needs, what else we need to do. And one of the concerns that were brought up early on was the fact that there was not a centralized location where they could find resources for people that are experiencing cancer-related condition. They wanted to know which agency are providing bilingual services or multilingual services in many instances. And so they really immediately, the staff and the investigator did a whole inventory and that information is our, in our website in trying to make sure that we, as we committed in the community forum to do that, that we actually follow through. And this is a wonderful uh, resource guide that is updated every year as new services are modified and improved or increased. And we have been able to, in that process, to make sure that we do a reality check. And that's one of the things that I'm gonna be mentioned shortly. Uh, the next one, please. So this is one of the things that I was getting at. One of the things that we are doing consistently since 2018 is what we call community check-in conversation. And they, uh, when we were doing face-to-face -face, is really going to diverse community, having kind of a listen session, focus group type discussion, if you wanna call it, but very informal, where we bring people from the particular community where we were at and we were able to then find out what are your needs? What are the resources? What are the challenges? And start documenting to the many stories and information given to us about what are the areas of priority that the community check needs to follow through in terms of meeting their expectation, but also in addressing the diverse needs and concerns that the people bring to our, uh, our attention. And so we have done that in English and Spanish. You have a particular slide as part of this slide that also talks about the conversación virtual con la comunidad, el impacto de COVID-19 en nuestras comunidades. And this is important because 
when the pandemic hit us, we had a whole bunch of activities planned for the spring and the summer month. We were all excited. We already had started the planning for this forum that was going to originally take place in one of the city colleges. And when the pandemic came, we had to re, you know, reorganize. The staff had done a wonderful job in trying to learn about Zoom and the technical aspect and see how can we be able to come up with timing discussions and topic where we wanted to hear. And we have been documenting that very nicely about people experiencing food insecurity, housing problem, people experiencing not knowing where to go as he already had been articulated because many, many medical centers and hospitals they were providing radiation or chemotherapy were not, had a, a temporary suspension of those services. So we were able to be, give them an opportunity for the community to share those experiences and their thought and to be able to figure out collectively, how can we be able to help them out and, and, and address the many diversity and bring them into the discussion, into problem solving solutions as well. And, and so the visual you know, meetings, uh, conferences has been wonderful, allowing us to reach out even to a larger audiences. The next one, please. And so this is where I'm gonna be stopping because um, uh, my colleague, Jenny, is going to be following up with this particular slide. And so Jenny, it's all yours. Um, in terms of you following up in this presentation about our achievement and lessons learned. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aida. Um, I'm truly honored to be able to share some thoughts about the work that Chicago Czech is doing uh, in the community and within the academic institutions. So this special, uh, on this slide, I'm going to address achievements that are very special to me as a teacher and also as a faculty member at Northeastern Illinois University. So this is where we try to, we inspire the community and the next generation. Uh, Chicago Czech has inspired, mentored, and trained students and fellows aspiring to be community health professionals. This year, we had even a larger group because, again, as, as Maggie Nava, our Maggie, as we, we refer to her, uh, has, she, she shared with us that, you know, one positive thing that came out of, uh, came out of uh, the pandemic, this pandemic, was that we were able to add more fellows which means more training and training the trainers who are going to share with their families all the knowledge, all the knowledge that they get from the Chicago Czech training. So anyway, so the fellows and students visited the community agencies. They were not trained in silos. Uh, they were involved in community planning events. They expanded the community cancer awareness and knowledge. And they conducted the cancer related research using community uh, engaged approaches. As you see, this was all the research that they were presenting. Um, at different events. Um, and they facilitated the cancer screening um, and care and they developed cancer res resources and linked people to services. Again, the trainer that uh, that becomes, the trainee that becomes a trainer. So um, it's been just wonderful to see that the impact is widespread because they take the knowledge they get and take it to their own families. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And so um, again, here we show different photos uh, of engagement where uh, the training happens in the community. Uh, the trainees visit various communities, as I said earlier, but then they engage the community, which engages them for a very successful experiential learning. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so while we have the qualitative and quantitative achievements that um, either referred to and that I just shared with you, uh, they happened with, with they didn't happen without challenges. And so um, you know the participation in in partnerships is time consuming, but 
the reward is amazing. Um, we know as many previous presenters uh, mentioned, there's a great need out there. We were able to see it on our, with, uh, you know, on our own, just from the Chicago che uh, the check-ins that I just shared and many other opportunities. We were able to see that is, there's a great need. People at risk living with cancer and cancer survivors are not having, you know, that have limited resources. So, and Chicago Check is responding in amazing ways with a different a variety of programs. Um, and then we have uh, community diversity, which is of course an asset, but it makes the work more complex. And to tell you that it's an asset, we, in, we want to increase participation. We will, our next steps are going to be going for more people to be engaged in this endeavor. So we want to reach out to um, diverse socioeconomic, linguistic and cultural backgrounds, such as Asian communities, Polish Americans, African immigrants, and many more. Next slide. Thank you. So with all of that, yes, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. We have become intentional about diversity, equity, and inclusion from the, the academic institutions and the community. We cannot do it without being intentional about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have a shared vision of eliminating cancer disparities. With everything we've learned, we know we just have to work harder and fight and Chicago Check is committed to that. We are also committed to achieving health equity in cancer prevention, diagnostic treatment and care. And without trust, cohesiveness and nurturing relationships, I don't think we would have been able to, Chicago Check would have been able to reach the achievements that we shared uh, earlier. Um, and we developed communication systems all along, you know, open and ongoing co communication systems. We have established consistency and concrete activities uh, that community members find beneficial. We have response left, right. we have had great feedback from um, the community and the academic institutions about how this, uh, the, the, the activities have contribute to the growth, again, of our students, our fellows, and so on, and our faculty members also, in addition to the community members. Uh, we have ongoing partnership evaluation activities that assess the pulse of the partnership. And that has taught us a lot, of course, and that's what we use to keep growing and creating more programs and expanding on what we already have. And we have also shared resources, expertise, and created opportunities to learn from each other. And that's actually mine, one of my favorites, because even creating this presentation, it was amazing to see the team coming together, one side after another, picture after another. It was just beautiful. Um, and our programs have built, have built in flexibility to adapt to changing environments, such as the COVID pandemic. Now, you, now we have, for example, check-ins on virtually. So we, we are constantly adjusting ourselves. And that's again, the beauty of bringing a group together and uh, Chicago Check has done amazing an amazing job that way. And more importantly, we have a strong organizational partners, staff, investigators, as Ida said, and other people. It's just, we can't do it alone. And that's what the definition really, that's what Chicago Check does beautifully. So from the communities to the academic institutions, it's been beautiful to watch the collaboration that's happening. Um, that's been created. And let's hear now from our um, leaders. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so says our dear uh, Henrietta and Joanne, uh, Henrietta Barcelo and Joanne Glenn, the co-chairs, uh, the CSC co-chairs have shared beautiful words and I'm going to give you a minute to just read them for yourselves. Um, just see how wonderful. I don't know if you can, maybe I should read it, maybe uh, not large enough. So um, Henrietta says, cancer doesn't stop during COVID-19. It keeps hiding, attacking, growing in our bodies. We have to keep up on cancer health 
for our mothers, fathers, children, tias, tios, e abuelos, and arm ourselves with information and resources that speak our languages and help us fight cancer when it strikes. I thought that was beautiful, really. Um, and then Joanne says, time goes fast. And five years ago, when we attended, when I attended the initial announcement of the NIH funding for the collaboration of Chicago institutions to focus on cancer equity, as a clinician and a respected community advocate, this presented an opportunity to serve, watch, participate, and keep our leaders, researchers, and academia in check. An opportunity, as the late great John Lewis, as uh, earlier uh, jo Joanna shared with us, said that was her, your opportunity to for good trouble, meaning if the community was not at the table, it was it would be concerning to fast forward, job well done, check. Thank you, Joanne, thank you. Um, next slide. Yes, thank you. Um, the, then we have two other community leaders, um, Carmen Velasquez and Rosemary Rogers. Um, Carmen says, the annual Chicago Che Community Forum is an incredible forum for the on the ground sharing of those who have and had cancer and those who have been touched by cancer through their families and extended families as we heard so many sad stories. Uh, so thank you, uh, Carmen. And uh, Rosemary says, since its inception, I have found the community forum has been a valuable tool for educating diverse populations that may not have been served before. Uh, it has provided culturally appropriate materials and given the attendees the opportunity to communicate, interact in a safe environment. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And again, um, I'd like to thank everyone. Next slide. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for the contribution, first of all, for the, the, the audience to be here. Thank you uh, for making it. We know there's so much going on out there, but thank you for making it to the forum. And then I'd like to thank the committee members who absolutely did a phenomenal job putting every piece together. It becomes even more com complicated when it's virtual, a virtual forum. So thank you. I'd like to also again thank uh, our community steering our community steering committee members and the co-chairs, Henrietta and Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, then the community engagement core colleagues and staff, you all did a wonderful job. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And of course, we all this work, it wouldn't have been possible if there hadn't been the grant, for the NIH grant uh, for National Cancer Institutes, uh, U54. Um, thank you very much uh, and for information. Uh, if you need additional information about the presentation, you may uh, reach out to me and, jo and Aida. Um, and then for general information about Chicago Check, please feel free to reach us by email, website, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Janine and Aida, for those wonderful words, and as well as sharing those wonderful words from our um, from, from some of our leaders. It was it was very nice. Thank you so much. Um, as a as a former uh, senior fellow for the Chicago Czech program and fellow um, for the research fellow for the program, I can tell you that the program is absolutely wonderful, and that they are doing wonderful work. And it's definitely opened my eyes, as well as many other of my peers who, are, who have participated in the program to the cancer outcomes as well as like all the information out there. So it's a wonderful program. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Up next, I believe on the schedule, we have our raffle winners. So for the raffle, if you haven't already, I believe that Melissa has sent the, the raffle um, link again. So if you haven't already signed in for the raffle, please do so. Um, it should be posted on both Zoom as well as I believe we're live streaming on YouTube. So it should be on there. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, but we'll be getting started with our raffle winners. Oh, awesome. 
All right, so I have received the winners. I, I wish we had a drum a drum roll, but um, for uh for our first winner, <laughs> for our first winner we have Nemo Tali Nemo Talahi Adabayo. Congratulations, Nemo is actually uh also a um a uh, prior research fellow. So congratulations, Nemo. And our second winner, uh, Nemo was number one hundred nine, and then our second winner is Evelyn McGee. Who is number 50. Um, thank you so much to everybody who participated um, in the in the raffle. But those are our two winners, Nemo and Evelyn McGee. Um, you will be contacted for, for the raffle. Thank you so much. Um, and then we before 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 we 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 uh, we let you out, I do want to say um we have a couple closing remarks. I want to say um thank you to everybody thank you to all of our speakers our community partners and thank you to you all of the attendees um for making day one of the 2020 community forum a success please join us tomorrow for day two which will focus on health and well-being for for those being touched by cancer and the use of telehealth during COVID-19 and also a reminder that tomorrow we will also be holding a uh, a raffle similar to this one so um, don't miss tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be filled with a bunch of uh, more interesting information, so be sure to tune in tomorrow. Um, but now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Awadi, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. So thank you so much, Allison, for being with us, and you can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. We might need to give um, Dr. Awardi a few minutes to get connected. I know we had her scheduled for 1250, so we're a little bit early. Um, this is Alicia. I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming today and participating <clears throat> in today's forum. Um, us as staff, we've been so excited, um, counting down the days, anxious for all of you to see um, all of the wonderful work that we've done to put this event together. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, also we just wanted to mention, um, we, we know we've packed a lot of information in, a, in a, only two hours. So one thing that we're doing with both um, today's agenda and tomorrow's agenda is some of these topics we'll be elaborating more in our virtual community conversations. And so we will be having that information posted on our um, forum website and on our um, Chicago Check website um, regarding what topics and which months we will be doing our sessions and elaborating on some of this information that we have been presenting today and we have upcoming for tomorrow. Um, I didn't know at this time if Dr. Wardy has joined us. Perhaps not. Um, has anyone in the audience have any questions at this time regarding either of the sessions that um, we'd like to go through? I see Dr. Simon's hand. Um, Dr. Simon, you can go ahead. I just wanted to give you all a shout out. You all are amazing and truly inspirational and thank you for everything. Um, I also wanna give everyone who took the time today to, sh to be here uh, a big shout out and thank you. I wanna emphasize a few big things. Vote, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I can't tell you who to vote for, but I want you to vote. Everybody's voice counts. If you're able, please, and get your friends and family. We need as many people voting as possible in this election. Our voice really is needed now more than it ever has been in our lifetimes. So healthcare is on the line. Um, COVID is on the line. A whole lot of things are on the line. Um, and finally, I wanted to encourage uh, in the spirit of Wakanda, uh, really, cancer screening is going to get left behind as we're ensconced in COVID. And I want to make sure that you understand that all of us around the city um, are still operating clinics and still doing cancer screenings and follow-ups. And, and please don't forget, don't delay that cancer screening, whether it's colorectal or breast or cervical or any of them, please, lung as well please get your cancer screening or reach out to your um, healthcare provider. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. Yeah, it's very important to vote. Everybody go out and vote. As we, we, we can't tell you who to vote for, but it's important that you just go out there and vote. And amidst all this COVID-19 um, going on, we want you to make sure like cancer is still an issue and it's definitely should be at the forefront, even though COVID has seemed to taken over everything. Um, I did see one hand. Um, I don't. I don't know if Selena uh, Roque, if you had a, if you had a question, still. It was an accident, but thank you so so much, all of you, for your time. I am so grateful to be here and to be a part of this, and I am very much looking forward to everything that happens tomorrow as well. So I have a question. Um, Joanne, how does one get involved with your butterflies if they're interested in pursuing that kind of wonderful relationship and organization, that wonderful tightness that you have with your, your, your ladies? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Uh, we'll find you, but you can go to what? W-O-T? You, you can email me at... Um, I'm trying to think of the best email you can do. You can just do what um, foundation at yahoo.com or you can call me at 312-391-2929. Again, 312-391-2929 or email whatfoundation at yahoo.com and we will connect you. Thanks. Do we have questions from the audience? Please unmute yourself and ask the questions. Thank you. I have put down the, the email for you, Joanna, if that's okay. I put it down in the, in the chat for everybody to see. Thank you. I just wanna echo what Dr. Simon said as well. Um, the, the voting is critical for healthcare, for the next levels and for survivorship. So don't think that Everybody's voting and you don't have to because we need your vote to count and take care of your health, so be well. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, the additional comments. Um, I wanna welcome Dr. Awardi on the floor. Um, Ever, did you wanna go ahead and introduce her? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for being with Dr. Addison Awadi. Um, Dr. Addison Awadi is the commissioner for the Chicago Department of Public Health, and she's here to um, give our, our closing remarks. So go ahead and get started whenever you're ready, Dr. Awadi. Thank you so All much right. for being with us. Of course, thank you. It's so nice to see some faces I know, and you know I've really been um, enjoying hearing the parts of this where I've been able to. Obviously, I think the focus, you know, for this conversation at this time, thinking about how cancer work relates with COVID, uh, this is what I think about all day, how all the things within the health department that we have long cared about and long worked on, how do we take this moment of COVID where people are thinking about health and health inequities and prevention and chronic diseases and environment and you know all of these pieces together, how has COVID-19 brought this to the forefront? And what do we do to push the things that we want to push with this slightly new lens. And I really have appreciated, you know, hearing, hearing how folks are thinking about it um, in this group and others. You know, first, I do obviously just want to congratulate uh, Chicago Check on the five years, uh, the work that you've all been doing to advance health equity, I really call out the leadership there um, that have brought this particular framing to the conversation in such important ways. Uh, and I really, whenever I see, you know, multiple multiple institutions really coming together around an issue. I love it because it means that we're all rowing together and rowing together, especially on issues like cancer prevention and making sure that everybody is getting the access to prevention, the access to treatment um, with a very community involved component is absolutely key. 
Some of you may know that later this afternoon, the Chicago Department of Public Health is actually finally launching our virtual Healthy Chicago 2025 plan. And I know many of you on the call are already aware of that. It was meant to launch back in March and April and obviously did not happen at this point. So we're doing a virtual launch 2.30 to 4. So if you, you're, you're still hanging in there for some Zoom, feel free to join us. Um, it'll be streaming on our Facebook page or you can go to uh, bit uh, bit period ly forward slash um, healthy chicago 2025 if you want to register but in case you don't know the whole focus for healthy chicago 2025 which was developed with hundreds of partners including many of you in your organizations is focused on the racial life expectancy gap here in chicago and we very specifically talk about especially the fact that black chicagoans on average live 8.8 .8 years less long than other chicagoans that gap is specifically to white chicagoans and we're seeing life expectancy drop for the first time here in chicago after decades but we're not seeing it drop among white Chicagoans. We're seeing it drop among African-American, Latinx, and Asian Chicagoans. And this is preventable. This is absolutely something that we can work on. And so much of it has to do with the root causes. So we'll be talking in some more detail if you join us, but I did want to highlight actually how cancer plays into um, some of those stats. So in that 8.8 .8 year gap, Almost half of it, 4.3 years, is what we call chronic diseases, which we sort of pull together uh, the diabetes, the heart disease, the lung disease. We specifically call out the fact uh, that cancer, I'm sorry, smoking related illnesses are two years of that gap right there. And then I did have the team um, pull specifically related to cancer and what we know about uh, sort of at that city level how much of the, the gap is being driven uh, by cancers. And broadly speaking, so in this 8.8 .8 year gap, 1.2 years of that gap is related to cancer. And this means the, you know, this isn't just the, the amount of time people are living, it's the difference between how long black Chicagoans and Chicagoans of other race, ethnicities, and especially white Chicagoans are living. And that's 13 and a half percent of the gap right there. Um, and if we break it down further, lung cancer is 3.2% of the gap, uh, colorectal cancer is about 2%, breast cancer is just under 2%, and all the other cancers together are about 6%. So Working on this, the exact things that this group is focused on are crucial if we are all together going to be thinking in a long-term way about building a healthier Chicago and one um, that is honest about talking about the long history of inequities and the ongoing uh, systemic, institutional, you know, racist systems, policies, ways people interact with the world um, and work to correct those in every way that we can and try to be honest about speaking about them. So we are absolutely um, thrilled to see the collaboration that's happening with so many community partners. Uh, Chicago Department of Public Health is wants to do whatever we can to help support this group. Uh, the important work that you're doing with community residents related to follow up and recommending screenings, making sure cancer survivors are linking into uh, support and treatment, thinking about how when people are affected by cancer, not just the immediate cause, but what does this look like in the long term? How do we grow from this? How do we build community? Um, and I really thank everyone involved in this, whether you're academic leaders, community leaders, civic leaders, community members, students. I know there's a lot of voices in this. Um, CDPH really stands with you in this vision. Uh, thanks to everybody who joined today. I know there's going to be much more interesting conversation tomorrow. And I really encourage you, I'm going to keep using this moment of COVID to try to raise the voice of public health, of healthcare, particularly around issues of inequity. COVID here in Chicago, 48% of our cases have been in Latinx, Latino or Hispanic Chicagoans. 43% of our deaths have been in African American Chicagoans. That has gotten attention. And that same disparity, which is due to all of the root causes that underlie why that has played out, 
are those same root causes that underlie the things that you're working on related to cancer. So thanks again to everybody uh, for the work you're doing and please be in touch if there are ways that the health department can partner and support and uh, let's all, you know, I heard the, the, the recommendation to vote. I would say absolutely also fill out your census pretty please right now. Uh, and then let's keep working together um, and uh, really aim toward what will, once we come out of COVID, I'm confident that continuing this conversation is going to be important, um, not just for cancer, but for all of the inequities that we're working on here in Chicago. So thanks again very much. Uh, congrats on a, a good first day. And I hope that the conversation tomorrow is uh, just as successful. Good. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Awadi. Um, while while you were speaking, I did I did see that there was a hand raised. I don't know if that was a question for you, but um, Denia, I think you had your hand raised. If you have a question, you can go ahead. Yes. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Denia Perello, y lo único que yo quiero agradecerles a ustedes por tan excelente, tan excelente información, en especial, ¿verdad? Nosotros que somos sobrevivientes de cáncer, eh, yo soy sobreviviente de varios tipos de cáncer, eh, de cáncer de seno, de cáncer de pulmón, cáncer de ganglio linfático y tengo dos operaciones de corazón. Y gracias a Dios y a todas estas eh, charlas, todas estas presentaciones, estas ayudas que ustedes nos dan, pues gracias. Eh, yo sigo adelante en esta lucha y estoy muy contenta de pertenecer a Chicago, ¿verdad? A, al grupo, a la organización eh, Proyecto Resurrección, a mi grupo de sobrevivientes de cáncer que se llama Ellas en la lucha a sobrevivir. Y sé que de todo esto que ustedes nos están informando a nosotras, vamos a sacar muchas cosas positivas, ¿verdad? Y pues yo en lo personal quiero decir, ¿verdad? Que todas las personas estamos en riesgo de, 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 de tener este COVID-19, pero especialmente las personas que somos vulnerables a esta enfermedad, que nos cuidemos, ¿verdad? Que si salimos, usemos nuestra mascarilla, ¿verdad? Y cuando lleguemos a nuestros hogares, por favor, eh, nos, eh, que las demás personas usen su mascarilla, que nos lavemos las manos, que nos bañemos, que tomemos todas, todas las precauciones, ¿verdad? Porque esto, esto va para largo. Pero gracias a ustedes, gracias ante todo a Dios, porque aquí nos tiene y seguimos adelante. Así que mañana estaré aquí porque me, me encanta mucho informarme y seguir todas las recomendaciones. Gracias. Muchas gracias a usted. Muchísimas gracias. Yeah, and um, as a translation, Denia is a double cancer survivor and she wanted to just say thank you for, um, to the commissioner and then all the speakers for the wonderful information. Um, she is part of the resurrection group um, called EYAS and she wanted just to keep in mind that everybody, um, just to be careful, everybody's um, suffering from COVID-19. It's, it's, it's a real problem, but also those who already have coexisting diseases such as cancer are also at higher risk. So uh, make sure you take care of yourself, wear your mask, use hand sanitizer, and make sure you take those precautions. But thank you so much, uh, Denia. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, but muchas gracias. Um, and I believe, I, I don't see any other questions. So I believe that is the end of our, our forum for today. Please be well, sure I to- I have a question. This is Aida, oh. I'm sorry. I, I oh yeah, no, it. go ahead, go ahead. Feel free. <laughs> well, first of all, Dr. Wardy, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for the wonderful remarks uh, because you are so much aware and is providing uh, leadership in, in, the, in mitigating uh, COVID-19. Can you be uh, specific and share some of the strategies that you're currently engaging to minimize the impact in the minority community, particularly African-American and Latino? Sure. So, you know, that in and of itself is probably a 45 minute conversation. But at the highest level, I think one of the things that we really from the very beginning here at the direction of the mayor, uh, 
very early on started really focusing on racial and ethnic um, you know, disparities in terms of outcomes, but we didn't just want to present data like right from the very, you know, just a few weeks in where we were seeing, especially early on, very hard hit uh, COVID in the African American community. We did pair this with what we call the race equity rapid response team. And that was a collaboration, you know, from the Chicago Department of Public Health and the mayor's office, but it's pulled in many, 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 many voices that are based in community. So yes, there is a group of providers, medical providers, but more than that, there are clergy, there are um, folks from like different community-based organizations, people who are activists have particular points of concern. And importantly, we specifically have focused, um, uh, made that group really the decision-making group in many ways. That group helped really define what our dashboards would look like, what kind of data were we putting out, what kind of language would we use. You know, epidemiologists very much like to talk about rates, you know, this many cases per 15,000, whatever. Uh, that is not necessarily language that is as usable. And so really, you know, this group said, okay, you can have rates on there, but put them low you know, turn it into language where I can say today, one in four Chicagoans has been tested for COVID. One in 37 Chicagoans has been diagnosed with COVID. I can, where we've set up our dashboard, and if you want to see this, you can go to um, chai.gov slash COVID dash. You can hover, if you go to the weekly view, every single week, you can hover over your zip code and see in my zip code, how many tests, how many people have been diagnosed, how has that changed, really trying to um, first of all, present data in a way that um, people were letting us know this is what people are wanting to know in my community. And then really with that group, every single week, we have worked to put, push resources to whatever area in Chicago is having the biggest issue with COVID. So every single week, we redo our strategy. Wherever we're seeing surging cases, increasing positivity, any concerns, we drive mobile testing, we drive additional outreach strategies. There's like a 23 point um, sort of plan that, that we go through, but it's all being done really through these community groups. So the health department says, here's data that says this zip code is the zip code where we're particularly concerned about. And then our many community partners are the ones saying, okay, in this zip code, this is the church, this is the group, this is the corner, this is the place where you need to put the resources. Here's what we need differently in terms of education. Here's where we want to partner, you know, the health resources with these trusted voices and community. We're, you know, this is a learning process every single week, uh, always trying to figure out how can we improve on that. I hope that this will just continue to get better, but I think we have really tried to be um, the provider of data for particularly for this kind of community based very local outreach and intervention strategy um, and then allowed that to be to really really be driven every week um, by where the needs are pushing resources where the needs are in a way that that folks who live in that zip code or community tell us will be most effective so just fundamentally I'd say that's that's one of the overarching strategies um, that we've been using and that I hope to really continue to expand on and grow. Um, we've also worked to push a lot of resources and fund community-based organizations uh, and clinical FQHCs and other providers think about that partnership in a way that if folks are doing that work for us, there also needs really to be some funding ideally um, to make sure that that's being supported well. Uh, and again, just trying to get everybody rowing together. Like there's a lot of opinions and a lot of thoughts um, but having a very race equity focused lens on COVID from the beginning, I think has been a strength for us. Um, it has kept the conversation focused around long-term investments, fitting into some of the mayor's plans, fitting into our Healthy Chicago 2025 plan. Um, it's a harder conversation in some ways, but we think it's an appropriate one. So check out our, our, our website, chicago.gov slash coronavirus, if you want to learn more about the details. But this, this, you know, really trying to figure out what is true community engagement and decision making. What does that look like? How can we continue to improve upon that? In my opinion, is how at the end of the day, we're going to win this thing. People wanting to do the right thing to the point of the last speaker wearing the masks, doing the things that work is an individual decision at the end of the day, as much as it is any um, 
uh, any law that I pass, any order that we put in place, and really feeling like I am part of the solution to COVID is about feeling like the messaging is speaking to me and to keeping my community safe. So that's one of our overarching strategies. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Awadi. Um, I want to be conscious of your time. Is it okay? Are you, can you stay for one more question? I believe we have one, one more question. question. All righty. Um, Esther Corpus, you can go ahead. Um, hi, Dr. Awadi. Um, thank you for participating today. Um, I, I am on the provider um, rapid response team and one of the, we, we are convening a meeting. We invited um, a CDPH. We're really concerned about um, winter testing and you know, what, what is strategies do we have um, to continue our, our testing efforts um, in Chicago with cold weather. And the second is flu shots. We, we were hoping that, um, you know, we could, we could offer a free flu shots to everybody. Um, but I understand that, that the city has a, a shortage and only has like 20,000 vaccines. Can you, can you speak to that? Sure, and um, certainly there will be more, you know, there's a lot of work happening on both of those. So we'll have some more opportunity in that forum to talk details uh, for, you know, there's a whole team working on cold weather planning because cold weather planning is not just about testing. It's actually thinking about uh, the vaccine campaign too. Uh, we're trying some things with our flu campaign that we're hoping to transition to the COVID vaccine campaign once it's available. Uh, we're thinking about even things, you know, people have gotten used to this concept of drive through or sort of walk through testing and social distancing, what does it look like to potentially try sort of a drive through vaccination strategy or a drive through and get out? How do we keep things warm? How do we think about this? Um, certainly, we think the mobile strategy is a good one. Um, there will, we're, we're exploring some more opportunities for, you know, sort of van type, uh, smaller number where there's, there's, there's um, more flexibility and fewer people, um, particularly around the testing strategy. Um, and we're working with very large spaces in Chicago, whether those are our community colleges, some of our big high schools, um, even some of the park district sites that offer large indoor spaces that can have good ventilation and safe, both for testing um, and for vaccine. Related to flu, so the city of Chicago purchases um, uh, flu vaccine doses, just as we do every year. And we push those, you know, again, where, where they tend to be most needed, a particular focus on folks who are uninsured. In addition to providing direct flu vaccine, we also are very, we work with, um, you know, a lot of the pharmacies around making sure vouchers are available. Uh, you know, flu vaccines are, tend to be very, very well covered for anybody who has insurance. And so um, particularly for people who are insured, we very much are encouraging people, uh, first and foremost, you know, get your flu shot through your health provider. That's always our number one message. Heading into um, fall and winter, especially, we would really like people to be connected to a healthcare provider. Um, especially if they have any underlying condition um, or if they are older. We know that as flu season comes, people are going to be getting symptoms. Is it flu? Is it COVID? There's going to be a lot of worry and a lot of testing need probably and decision making. And the more we can make sure folks are connected to providers, the better. So we've actually been pushing kind of first and foremost, like now's a good time to make an appointment, you know, with your health provider uh, for your flu vaccine and to make sure that you have any of your chronic conditions and things sort of in line right now while we're in good control. We also are pushing pretty hard on pharmacies. Um, um, because they will be a big part of our campaign strategy, even for COVID vaccine, when it becomes available. We have sort of an all hands on deck plan that includes providers and pharmacies and clinics and stand up and all sorts of things. And so um, uh, encouraging people, you know, CDPH will be offering some, but we'll be doing more pre-registration as opposed to walk up like we've done previously. That's also similar to more what we'll have for COVID around um, having separation. So we'll, we can say more when we meet, um, but I think think broadly, we obviously want to want a very good flu uptake this year. Um, CDPH will have some of this available, but we'll also be working with vouchers, pharmacies, and providers, um, and uh, with a particular focus for, for the health department on those who are uninsured. Thank you, Dr. Aguadi. And, and we, you know, as FQHCs don't have the luxury of a big gymnasium or, you know, so we, right. we want to continue to do testing. So we really, we don't want to figure it out in a vacuum. We really want to do this in collaboration with the city. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we, 
we're doing so much testing right now. We hate to just, you know, stop testing because of, because of the winter, because of yeah. weather. Right. And I think it's about thinking, you know, there's the testing that can happen within regular clinical settings um, versus some more of the like mass testing pieces. And, you know, CDPH at this point is actually doing about a third of the COVID testing that's happening across the city every day, which is not, it's a lot. It's actually not necessarily our ideal state because we're seeing people move from providers sort of to more of these 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 roll throughs and we're working hard to make sure people are ideally connected back right like so that so that this testing is connected to clinical providers. So, you know, you, you're probably aware we um, released some new funding that we offered to all the FQHCs in the city uh, and 19 of the systems took us up on it um, to have some additional funding, you know, to think about what does support look like around testing, case investigation, contact tracing. Um, but I think that COVID testing, they're sort of in the clinical setting need, you know, will continue to be something that we very much want to support, especially in FQHCs. Um, uh, while we pair that with more of the, of the mass type, uh, testing. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Awadi, and for all those amazing questions. Um, but yeah, we are wrapping up day one of our community forum. So I just want to reiterate, thank you to all our speakers, community partners, and to all the attendees who may, who are able to make day, day one of the 2020 community forum success. Um, don't forget to join us tomorrow for day two, which will focus on health and well-being for those touched by cancer and the use of telehealth during COVID-19. And um, I do believe that uh, Alicia did um, post the uh, the link for the event that Dr. Awadi was speaking about. It's from 2.30 to 4 p.m. So if you would like to go ahead and join in on that, the link is in the chat for Zoom. And I believe you just need to register and the event will open up at 2.30. But yeah, thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Bye. Thank you.